Father, we thank you that you are a big, big God. A God who is so big that you will never let us go. No matter how far we run from you, no matter how much we try to isolate ourselves, you are there with us, Lord. And we thank you that you come and you dwell among us, Lord, so that we can celebrate you and we can praise you simply for the glory of who you are. And Father, I thank you for all of the churches who are meeting Lord, I pray that, uh, that all of our meetings, whether they're happening right now or happening later or happened earlier or happened elsewhere on this weekend or happening around the world, that they would glorify your name, that they would lift high the name of Jesus, the name above every other name. And Father, I pray that we, even here in this church, but as Christians, as the, as the body of Christ, Lord, that we would um, continue to strive to remove from ourselves doing things from selfish ambition and vain conceit but that we would consider others to be more significant than ourselves because you, the great and mighty God, condescended down to us and you freed us from the shackles of our own iniquity, Lord. And so we praise you for your goodness, for our goodness that we can't always understand, Lord, but that you will never let us go in the midst of that. And we thank you for all of the churches, the churches that have gone on, the churches that have closed their doors, the churches that are yet to come. And I pray, Father, that it would never be about our institution, but that it would be about you, Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. May we honor you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week, we got to hear a thoroughly impassioned Dave. As he, yeah, see some of the laughter, you guys know, you all were here. Um, as he spoke on this biblical theology of serving, right, using, using our gifts. And I don't know if you know this yet about cross points, but we, our desire is not for us just to be uh, people who have our noses in our Bibles, oblivious to the world around us. We're not called just to knowledge of God, but to be ambassadors, stewards, individuals who are working not on our own power, but we're to be working and we're to be stewarding this creation and God's word. We're not passive. We don't sit around just waiting for the second coming of Christ, twiddling our thumbs. But we want to be active and involved in caring for and uplifting the dignity of those the world marginalizes, but God says, you are loved. So serving each other in the world around us, in our city that's in need of so much love, in our neighborhoods, in our church, this is an expected part of serving in growth groups, which is what this whole series has been about. It's about the Word, but it's about how one of the ways we're going to live out the Word. See, we want to be a church that lives sacrificially and points others to Jesus. Now, before I start my portion of the message, there's, there's a, an, a problem that just needs to be spoken on, rectified. Um, Dave, Dave made a boo-boo last week. He had an oopsie doodle. A mistake, a foible, a fumble, if you will. Nothing theological. Yes. No, no heresy was preached. Um, but in his excitement, Dave said a certain word a number of times. And it has come to our attention that that word might have been misheard or misinterpreted perhaps by those watching online or perhaps by some parents who were maybe a little concerned. And so I just want to clarify for everybody that Dave was in fact saying crab B with a B as in that little crustacean that crawls on the ocean floor. And he was not using the letter P there. Um, so for the parents who were concerned about that, that is, that is what he was saying. And I know that for some of you, you're like, that's not that bad of a word, but we're not, we're, we're not here to speak our convictions unto others. So I just wanted to clarify and let everybody know he said crabby, and he said it more times than they do at a seafood restaurant. And so just, just know that he was really excited about that idea. And please be assured, um, we have enrolled Dave in diction classes in order to assist. <laughs> that last part is a joke. We have not enrolled Dave in an addiction class, but... I just wanted to set some hearts and minds at ease. And with that in mind, I want to get back to our series. Today is the last day of our GROW series. The series where we're trying to set ourselves up to launch a deep, intimate, personal fellowship with Christ through deep, personal, intimate fellowship with each other. Last week, Dave obviously talked 
about serving, and I just really want to, to mention a specific individual. Um, he has no idea that I'm going to do this, but I just want to recognize Ethan Bevel, um, who did our graphics for us for this series in, in a wonderful act of service. So thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful graphics. And in fact, I just, I don't know if any of you are into this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I, I, I have like, I'm like a so like Ethan is like a grade A designer. I'm like a grade maybe C or D designer, right? But I loved this font. And so you'll notice as you look at more of our growth group materials as they come out and as they're published on the website, that this font is probably going to be just our growth group font in general. I love it. So it's a wonderful choice. This, the, the design is fantastic. So thank you for being so willing to serve and use your gifts in the church. And now that I've embarrassed two people since I've been up here. <laughs> Next week, we're going to be jumping back into the Gospel of John. Okay, and we're going to continue that all the way out to Christmas and then beyond Christmas. The Gospel of John is thick, right? And so we're going to be spending a lot of time in that book. But until then, until next week, we are going to be talking about growing together. And today I want to talk about growing our foundation. Now, in Scripture, because Scripture is this wide collection of different authors who the Spirit was working through. Occasionally, as you're reading through it, you might notice that if you look at the fullness of Scripture, they mix metaphors occasionally. And so I just want to just set you up to understand that when I talk today about the foundation, or about the head, or about the cornerstone, I'm talking about Christ. Whatever those words, whichever words those are, whichever words are being used in Scripture, that's always what it's referring to in these instances, unless it explicitly states otherwise. The foundation of our lives needs to be Christ. And that's not something that should cause guilt or frustration. It, it results in freedom. Galatians says that for freedom, Christ has made us free. And none of what we're doing, none of why we serve, none of why we, why we uh, pray, none of, none of why we fellowship together actually means anything if it's not built on the foundation of Christ. So today we're going to be in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 4. If you have your Bible or your device with you, um, I'd love for you to join me in flipping there. I cheated and I pre-marked it so I can flip there really quickly. Um, if you need a pew Bible, we have them. Uh, 1007 is the page that we're going to be on, with an immediate flip over to 1008. So I'm going to start reading at verse 1. But we're really going to be talking about some verses later. I just want to give us some context for the word. This is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you, urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. And so this is the context for what we're going to talk about, the, kind of the, the textual context, if you will. And I just want you to notice that we're to, keep, we're to keep the bond of unity through Jesus. We are passive recipients of the unity. This is where our work comes in. We have the good grace and blessing and occasional frustration in our flesh where we can hinder the unity of Christ's church. And I don't think that it would be overstating to say each one of us has been guilty of that at some time in our lives and might be guilty of that in our future. But we're to strive to not, we're to strive to keep the unity that's been provided through the death and resurrection of Christ. How great of a testimony is it that, that a, this church, Crosspoint, has such a variety of thought and diversity of, on God's creation you look at the choir alone and we see generations represented in this church. That's amazing to me. And despite our variety of thought and, and ideas, there's one creed that we are able to agree on when we are present at this church. And it's that 
uh, sixth verse, right? There is, or fourth verse, whatever it is. There's one hope, right? There's one body. There's one spirit. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. There isn't, there isn't a voting booth a skin color, an economic situation, a social situation, a policy belief, a past or present sin that is over God. Not one. And sometimes we let things do that to us though, right? And with that in mind, I'm going to jump just a couple verses to verse 11. So, Paul is saying, because of what we just talked about, that unity, right? So, because of that, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunning and craftiness of people and the, their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. In order to maintain unity, Paul says, here's the plan. Paul says, Christ gave us some people with some particular giftings, these offices of the church, and their job, their goal, their calling is to equip the body of believers to train them, to set them up for success, to help them along the way. To do the works of service, ministry. See, ministry isn't just what happens here on Sunday. This is a part of it, but it's not the whole of it. This isn't, I would venture to say, this isn't even the pinnacle of ministry. This is, this is the place where we're on-ramping to head towards the pinnacle of ministry. Like Dave talked about last week, Sunday is, more, you can think of it more like we're trying, to, we're trying to give ourselves fuel so that we can go out and do the good works to which he has called us. You don't, you don't come here specifically only to get discipled. You come here to get excited about going out and discipling together. Information transfer, data transfer, I talked about this a couple weeks ago. It's not the same thing as discipleship. Knowledge puffs up, but knowledge applied, that's wisdom. And application of knowledge takes practice. It takes people helping you, challenging you, speaking truth and love to you. And so growth groups here at Crosspoint, they're intended to be additional opportunities to do the works of service, right, the works of ministry, and to maybe get a midweek gas up, fuel up in the word, to live out the calling to which you are reborn into when you are birthed as a new creation in Christ, when you are reborn into the priesthood of believers. You are called to minister to each other. Christ calls each of us to the work of discipleship together. Together. Too many Christians, and I'm really thankful that I'm hearing all, all those amens, because I'm so thankful that this church doesn't, doesn't model this um, uh, all the way through, but too many Christians these days think that church on Sunday is all about them. You've maybe heard it lamented as like consumerist Christianity, church shopping, right? We're looking for the thing that makes us feel good in the moment, maybe in an emotional high, or the thing that maybe doesn't let us, doesn't make us feel uncomfortable, right? We want to make sure that if they do speak on that, that big 
P word that rhymes with schmalitics, that they align with our thoughts only and never challenge us and never challenge us into a Christ that is above those things. So we, we treat so often church like it's about us. We, we often think of this pastor figure as like this man of God who somehow is smarter than the rest of us and has divine revelation that the rest of us don't have. Friends, when you live in the United States of America, we have divine revelation in like 400 different translations. <laughs> We're to minister, to disciple together, each other. And there are things that the, pastor, the office of pastor or the pa- office of evangelist are uniquely gifted to do, but they are not the everything. And sometimes we treat them like they are. Sometimes there is special, maybe counseling or prayer that's needed. Maybe some type of shepherding, right, assistance, rebuke. These are things that, that there is a place for in the pastor. But man, each of you, every single person sitting in a pew or in a chair is designed to be doing this discipleship work with each other. Sunday is primarily to be a place of equipping, learning, growing together, hearing the gospel sung and preached to fuel us up to go out into the world to minister to those around us. Congratulations, you're all in seminary. You are all also disciplers and disciples. You are following Jesus and you're helping others to follow Jesus. Bless you. So these offices are given to equip and train Christ's people for works of service. And they do that so that, it says, the body of Christ may be built up, grown, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. What faith? Remember those two verses at the top that I went through? One Lord, one God who's over all and through all in it and all. That's our faith. This is the second time in this letter that Paul is referencing building together. And so I just want to read from you, for you uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Uh, Paul's saying to the Gentile believers who are in the church, he says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. You're not outside the family of God, he's saying, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Without that cornerstone, friends, it ain't going to hold up. Everything tumbles down. In him, Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. See, Christ is the cornerstone of our faith, right? He's our, he's our chief uh, unifier. He's doing the unification. But we're being joined together in him. In him. That's like a weird thing that if you're, if you're, if you're young in your faith, like that can be a kind of a strange idea. Like, what do you mean in Christ? If you want a really good answer to that, talk to Rick Bavell. I heard him explain it wonderfully. <laughs> but we are. We're being joined together in Christ. We come together under the, the, the blood of the Lamb who has risen from the grave. And as we grow, we rise to become a holy temple to the Lord. Isn't that just beautiful imagery? A holy temple. What, what happens in a temple? What's the purpose of a temple, of temple imagery? A temple is God's dwelling place. It's where he abides with us. This is why the temple was so important in Jerusalem, why it was such a lament when God's presence left the temple because he left dwelling with his people, and yet each of us is individually called a holy temple, and each of us corporately gets to also exist as a temple. God dwells with us here. 
wherever two or three are gathered. But this requires physical presence, right? It requires embodiment. You can't support one another unless you're right next to them, right? Like two beams trying to support each other. If there's a, a beam here, I'm going to pull a Dave again. If there's a beam here, and then if there's a beam all the way over here that's only this tall, they can't support each other. It isn't until they move close together that they're able to be a support. You can't build a wall without some type of support structure. You can't build a roof without additional support. You can't build rooms and doors in each piece of a building without not just willingness, but presence. Presence. And we're growing until we reach unity. And this is all of us. We're not accepted from this. I don't like people. I'm an introvert. Life would be better if I just didn't have anybody else on the road while I'm driving. That's a you problem. That's a sin problem. Not being an introvert. Not being an introvert. Being an introvert is totally a personality thing, right? The, this, idea, this idea that life would be better if other people weren't around me, that's a sin problem. I love introverts. I married an introvert. Please, please don't soundbite me out and send that viral somewhere. This church thinks that introversion is a sin. Oh, man. We, we continue growing until we reach unity in our faith. And this takes time and effort and energy and vulnerability and pain and joy and all of those things that make us human but that we want to stuff down and say we don't experience them. Because we want to put on a happy face when we come in here on a Sunday and say, well, I'm a Christian. Jesus loves me. I shouldn't have any difficulty. But we can't support each other if we don't know that we're leaning. Every one of us is responsible to be a part of this work. Every one of us has something to offer each other. Every single one of us. Now, how do we grow in knowledge of something or someone, right? That's what this passage says, right? Well, no, we will uh, be, uh, reach the unity of faith in the knowledge of son. Well, so when we're learning about somebody, we study them. And that can maybe feel a little academic or weird, but if you think about it, maybe you're in a relationship or you've been in a relationship or you're married. You spend time studying. You're supposed to ask questions. What's your favorite color? Who'd you vote for last election? All the really easy ones. And then after you get married, one of the pieces of advice that I think every couple receives at their wedding when they're given the, the advice cards from people is to never stop dating your spouse. Because we want to continue asking questions. We want to continue studying someone. We want to continue to get to know them. Because the depths of man's heart are unsearchable, except by God. But we're going to try for those people we care about. We're going to plumb those depths and get to know them. We argue with those people we're trying to get to know. I don't know if you know this, but there's a fair amount of, of description in Scripture of individuals arguing with God. We cry with them. We celebrate with them. You can't grow in your faith and knowledge of, of the Son of God without learning about him. And you don't need somebody up here necessarily to, to do that for you. We have devices where we can access Scripture almost anywhere in the world. Bibles, countless Bibles and translations. I was originally going to title this message, Grow Your Study of God, but I felt like all of the pews would be empty if I did. Because I don't want people to think that we're necessarily going to school, even though I did say that we're all in seminary. But that's, that's what we're doing. God has chosen, he's deigned, he's made the decision to let us in to his word revealed to us. We don't have to wonder. Now, there are things that we disagree about in terms of how we, how we read certain things in this. And that's one of the things, again, I love about this church. Because there are things theologically that maybe different people see differently, but that creed, that faith that we believe in stays firm. One Lord, one Spirit, 
one God and Father above all. We're not expected or asked to, I would even say we're not even suggested to in Scripture, try and learn about God all on our own. It's meant to be a community project. God has created us for community, like we heard that first week. He wants us to do these things together. That's why there's so many wonderful Bible studies out there where we can learn from men and women who have studied maybe a topic or a passage more deeply than maybe we have time to, and we can learn from them. Or we could disagree with them. But we get to grow with them. And when we're in growth groups, your growth group leaders aren't going to be there to be preaching at you. You're not going to get another sermon. You're going to be learning together, asking questions of God together, arguing with each other, hopefully not as much, as maybe arguing with God about what his word says and trying to continue to build ourselves in unity, not by our own power, but by the power of the Spirit who's working it out in us. So each week, during, when you meet in your groups, you're going to be looking to God's word to continue charging and fueling yourselves up. And then we'll turn ourselves, our, our vision outward to our immediate neighbors, to our church family, to our community, where we're going to work in the community. We're going to serve, maybe sacrificially on our time or our gifts. Oh, I don't really like hanging out with that person, but I'm going to serve them anyways. When you don't get to know somebody deeper, when you don't study them, when you don't deepen that relationship, the relationship stays immature, right? It's shallow. And when we pursue this, when we pursue studying who God is, it moves us towards becoming mature. It moves us towards becoming mature because some Christians have been Christians for a really long time. And they're still spiritual infants. In that, they haven't matured their relationship with the Lord. And maybe it's because they haven't been equipped well from the churches that they've grown up in in their lives. Or they didn't grow up with parents who knew how to disciple, so they're just trying to flounder and figure it out. But hear me, that's why we need to be doing it together and discipling each other to be growing each other. Paul says in in 1 Corinthians, brothers and sisters, he says, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? See, sometimes we forget. One of the aspects of growing mature just as a, as a human being is when we move to those solid foods, we start feeding ourselves as well. Right? We don't keep getting the... Right? We don't, we don't keep getting that. We don't need that. Some of us are so desperate to constantly be fed because we, we don't believe that if we don't have maybe this man of God figure up here teaching us that we somehow can't grow in our faith. But we don't follow Paul or Apollos or Dave or Michael or Rick. We follow Christ. Paul finishes that section. He says, what, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I, Paul, planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But God has been making it grow. God has been making it grow. So each of you, as you do the work of ministry for which we are prayerfully striving to equip you, you become planters, you become waterers, but God does the growth work. God does the growth work. Some of us need to move beyond the milk and into solid food and into feeding ourselves and into pouring out into others. When we do this, when we grow ourselves, we start to move 
towards attaining the whole fullness of Christ, the standard of Christ. When you read passages like the fruits of the Spirit, when you read passages like Philippians 2, those are the things to which we're attaining, not by our own power, right? We train ourselves in godliness, as it says in 1 Timothy, but God does the growth work. Some of you, maybe the, the training language is helpful for you. You think about going to a gym. I, can, I would just say that if I don't go to a gym with somebody, I ain't doing nothing. I'm going I'm to post, I'm going to sit down on a bench, I'm going to post on Instagram, be like, at the gym, and then I'm going to sit and float through Instagram for the next hour. Right? Some of us need that in our Christian walk. We need to go into the gym, into, into growth groups, into the Word, and we need somebody to walk alongside us. And guess what? That's not a bad thing. That's how you were made to be. That doesn't make you weak. That makes you wise. Then, Paul says, verse 14, we will no longer be infants. Tossed back and forth by the waves. Blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. When we grow that foundation in Christ, when we're doing that together, supporting one another, living as we're supposed to be living, we become more firmly grounded and rooted and planted in him. And we become stable not only on the rock of ages that will not be moved, but also because we're built together. And like a cord of three strands that cannot be easily broken, except by Troy when Dave is the one who's putting together the, the, the cord. <laughs> like a cord of three strands that cannot be easily broken, it will be a lot harder for us to fall starry-eyed into the traps. And there's a lot of people who put traps out there. Politicians, Republican and Democrat, people around us who desire to steal maybe our hope or our possessions, conspiracy theorists who thrive on bearing false witness against others, maybe that they've never met, and oftentimes are actually other Christian brothers and sisters. Even just well-meaning Christians who have never learned to properly handle the word of truth. They haven't had that discipleship, those people around them. When we're together, it's a lot harder to go astray. Not impossible. We can be incredibly stubborn. I talk to my, my youth group a lot about, so we're called sheep a lot in scripture. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, and I use a lot, whenever I'm talking about it, I remind the kids, I showed them this video early on, uh, maybe some of you have seen it, where there's a sheep. Um, so sheep are dumb, okay? Like that's just, that's, that's part of why that we're called sheep in scripture, because we are dumb. But sheep are dumb, okay? And so there was this sheep who was stuck, you know, like face first in, in like this little gulch thing, right? And so the, the shepherd or farmer or just a passerby comes and pulls the sheep out, puts it on solid ground. And the sheep goes, boom, boom, <laughs> right back into the gulch. And this is, not, this is a live video of an actual sheep. Like, this is how dumb they actually are, right? And I'm sure none of us can relate to doing something like that in our lives. Never. When people in this world want to separate you from your hope that you have in Christ, they'll do it in a number of ways. I think the most common that I've seen is they'll use rhetoric that's filled with fear and anger. Or they'll use rhetoric that's filled with, with underlying greed that speaks to our, our own fleshly passions. Oh, you want a lot of money, don't you? Let me tell you how you get it. Send us $20, we'll pray over it, and then send us 20 more, and just keep doing that for a while. There are people who do that. But we, we don't have a faith of fear. We have a faith in hope. We have a faith of hope in a resurrected Lord and a coming resurrection into glory. The only thing in this world that we need to fear, the only thing, is God. And the beautiful thing is that 
We don't really even need to do that. Because we fear him because when we consider the magnitude and the power of a God who, you want to talk about cancel culture, God can, can just poof everything in the universe out of existence. That's scary. That's scary power. Yet, yet, we know that he is a God who is faithful to his promises, who is steadfast in his love, which endures forever. That's our God. We're not afraid of God because he's mean and angry and a stodgy old man sitting in a throne behind some golden gates that St. Peter is guarding. We fear God simply when we understand the sheer magnitude of his power. But then we, we can fall to our knees in celebration when we recognize that he so loves us that in a covenant with the entire human race, he, he formed through the refraction of water droplets in the sky a rainbow. We can understand that we have a God who is all-powerful, but we fall to our knees when we understand that he condescended, he came down and brought himself down in the form of human, of a servant. He, he dwelt with us bodily. Because he so loved the world. And now we, church, get to be a temple where he continues to dwell. Man, what a God we serve. We serve a God who is so powerful that while we might look at him and question and wonder, Lord, am I even worthy to fall down upon you? He says, no, but I'm going to take the shackles of your sin and your inadequacy anyways. That's the God that we serve. Don't let other people pull you from the hope that we have in Christ by isolating yourself from the fellowship of believers and re don't retreat down rabbit holes online and in books and in forums and on YouTube and on Facebook and on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. You're not strong enough to do it on your own. And that's an amazing thing because God doesn't ask you to. God has crafted us to need each other in order to point a dark and hurting world to our incredible unity that we have on the foundation of Christ. Psalm 133 says how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like a precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, and all the moms just shuddered a little bit, but this really is beautiful language in, in Old Testament. Down the collar of his robe, this rich, expensive ointment pouring down a blessing. It is, it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So instead of being blown about by craft, by cunning, slippery words, empty promises. Can we speak the truth in love to each other? Now that phrase has been weaponized by a lot of Christians and a lot of non-Christians. But when we are building ourselves up together, that is what we do. Because here is the truth. The truth is that God so loved the world that he came down, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. Because we have a, fear, a, a, a faith of hope, not of fear. Now, this isn't, this isn't just about Bible study. This isn't just about serving. It's about all of it. But mostly, it is about Christ. Because what do we do when, we, when we're doing these things? We'll no longer be infants tossed to and uh, fro, to and uh, back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is our goal. To grow into the body of Christ and the fullness of what that means. If you're curious about what this incredible standard of Christ is, it talks about it in Philippians 2, where it says that Christ, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. 
And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. May we grow in patience, gentleness, meekness, humility, steadfastness, and most of all, may we grow in the power of Christ who came and died and rose again to the praise of his glory alone. Now, I want to, um, I'm going to have the worship team start heading up. I want to give you guys a little bit of just kind of information, some more information about growth groups, and we'll, we'll close out. And we're going to be starting growth groups because we think that discipleship is so much more than just, and don't hear what I'm not saying, we think it's so much more than just Bible study. Bible study is good and it's amazing. We have some incredible Bible study teachers who do a phenomenal job on Wednesdays. And if you're not in that Bible study, I highly encourage you to go into it. But discipleship goes more than that. It's also actively serving together through good times and hard times. It's supporting each other on Christ and for Christ's glory. It's hearing about each other's lives on a regular basis. Remember, sharing the gospel and sharing our lives. Praying for each other, exhorting each other to holiness, confessing our sins, weeping with one another over our weakness, yet celebrating God's power shining forth through our weakness. We want everyone to be a part of our growth groups. And ideally, we'd love to see every growth group as this little microcosm of Crosspoint, right? With a variety of theological, generational, political, socioeconomic, and ability diversity. Each group is going to meet once a week. Um, and it's either going to be studying through the, a book of the Bible together, or studying maybe continued conversations on the sermons from Sunday, or perhaps a topical book that where you were learning from the saints who have thought on things that we maybe don't have time or even the capacity to do so. And then after we, that we move into conversation where we talk about the highs and the lows, right? The, we talk about the time where we say, man, I've been really angry with my boss lately. Or we say, my boss and I have talked and reconciled. Thank you for your prayers. Or we say, I might be losing my job soon. Or we say, I got the job. Or we say, I just received this diagnosis and my life has changed. Or we say, my scans came back clean and I no longer have that diagnosis. And the many other aspects of life that we live through. These groups are not, unless otherwise stated, limited in who can sign up. So if you're single, you can join a group that's led by one of our incredible couples. If you're in a relationship, right, you can join a group led by two non-married individuals. That's fine. We will have specialty groups now and then. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that for specific purposes. But our desire is for us to be learning and growing from each other, discipling each other together, even maybe from those who we don't initially think we can learn from. Because the reality is that all of those different people, the blue collar, the white collar, the young, the old, the Republicans, the Democrats, the wealthy, the poor, the young earth creationists, the old earth creationists, we are all, every one of us, members of the body of Christ and under one God who is above all and through all and in all. So as we grow in maturity, church, I want to leave you with this, the final verse from this passage, from him. From Jesus, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. May we all grow and build one another up, each of us, from him, doing the work to which God has called us. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you give us a unity that goes beyond understanding that the culture and society and world around us might tell us shouldn't happen or is unrealistic, Lord. But we have a faith not in those earthly kingdoms, Lord, but we have a faith in you. The God who formed the earth, the King above all kings, the Lord of lords. Father, I just ask as we, as we as Crosspoint move into these things we're calling growth groups, Lord, I pray that you would be present through that ministry. That there would be grace as we learn, Lord, but that we would grow, that we would learn from each other. 
and that we would recognize that our foundation is not Crosspoint Church. It's not Dave or Michael. Our foundation is you, Lord. And may that be our resounding song for the rest of our lives. And that's in your most holy, precious, and powerful name we